In the spring of 1945, um, the Allied search for Nazi-era looted cultural objects secreted in castles, monasteries, salt mines, and other locations in Germany and Austria resulted uh, in an important musical, literary, and artistic discovery. Um, and this is the cover on the first page. Uh, um, and you pronounced it, I pronounced it the Feral Vogue, it's probably incorrect. But uh, the Guillaume de Michaud medieval manuscript, known today as the Feral Vogue, after two of its prior owners, actually one of its current owners and one of its prior owners, um, uh, this manuscript was created by France's greatest poet and composer of the 14th century. Uh, it was confiscated from its owner in Paris in October 1940 great to have bells in the background, <laughs> uh, just months after the German occupation uh, uh, of Paris, and it is one of the most important musical losses suffered on French soil uh, during the Nazi era through confiscation. Uh, to, so today I'm going to share with you this history recently published in this two-volume book set, um, which by the way is also in the music department if anybody's interested uh, to look at it further. And uh, it was published by the Digital Image Archive of Medieval Music at the University of Oxford. So a little bit about uh, the background of my research. So my research focuses on a much broader subject of music, uh, musical material culture losses during the Nazi era, as well as the aftermath of these losses, recoveries, and why this subject still matters today in the 21st century. So I had documented this, uh, this manuscript in my files from archival research in France, in Germany, and in the U.S. And I was in discussions with uh, one of the editors for this book project, who was then the uh, librarian at the British Library. And kind of by chance, I learned about this project. And at that point, uh, it became clear that uh, the researchers had a gap on the World War II era history. And I just happened to have this research in my files with a lot of other French materials. Mm -hmm. So this led to really at the very end of this I think, couple year project on this book, an invitation to contribute my research to the study. I was thrilled to be able to do that and find a good place for this uh, research in, the, in this really interesting study. And so that's that specific subject, that case study is what I'm going to be speaking to you about today. And in a sense, it's very emblematic of so many other stories uh, with a nexus to the Nazi era that have yet to be identified, understood, and analyzed. Christopher de Hamel, medieval manuscript expert and fellow at Corpus Christi College, University of Cambridge, has said of the Michaud Feral Vogue, quote, it is very rare indeed for a manuscript as important as the Feral Vogue Codex to have been ushered so unexpectedly uh, onto the world stage, for it has a value over such an exceptionally wide field of medieval studies encompassing music, literature, art, and the patronage of learning, every one of them at the very highest level. The Feral Vogue Codex was copied for the first time in the 1380s and most recently in 2014. <laughs> Both occasions launched it into the astonished world and his story is not yet finished. That's the end of his comment. So before I turn to the 20th century history that's the focus of my talk today, I want to talk briefly about Guillaume de Machaut, the contents of the manuscript, his history of ownership, its provenance. So I'm not a musicologist, uh, so forgive me for that, but uh, just a, a few brief words on this. So. Okay, hopefully I can uh, get, get all this uh, organized with my laptop over there. Okay. Um, of Guillaume de Michaud, um, the first slide is his portrait, uh, which is uh, kind of amazing to think about. He was the most important poet and composer of the 14th century. Commentators have uh, noted Michaud as historically on par with Dante, Petrarch, and Chaucer. His output holds a key position in the transition between new ideas that took place in the decade around 1300 and the music of the late Middle Ages. As a poet musician, he brought together the traditions of secular monophonic music and the new polyphonic techniques of the Ars Nova. He lived from 1300 to 1377 and was in the service of Jean de Luxembourg, King of Bohemia, from about 1323 he was a canon of Reims Cathedral from April 1340. 
In addition to Jean de Luxembourg, other patrons associated with Michaud included Charles II, King of Navarre, Jean Duc of Berry, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, Pierre de Lassignon. Documented contacts include the Dauphin, later Charles V, and his literary works provide insights into some of the traumatic events of his time, um, such as the plague and the siege of Reims by the English in the mid uh, 1300s. So of the manuscript, in its nearly 700-year-old life, it was largely inaccessible during most of this period to scholars and musicians, which is one reason that it has held such you know, drama uh, uh, when it finally became available. So it wasn't really very available for research, study, and performance, with a few minor exceptions. So this all changed when the current owners permitted the Machos, uh, per, uh, permitted the digital scanning of the Machot and its posting online at uh, the Digital Image Archive of Medieval Music at Oxford. Um, and so here's, a, here's an image of um, kind of the website. If you're interested, it's free. You can log on. You can look at the music if you're a musician. You can copy it and perform it if you're, uh, you know, it's just incredible. Um, it was on loan there for a while. It is no longer on loan there. Um, but, it, you know, uh, it's available online. And um, the other access is this book, um, which is a 789-page full-size color reproduction of the original manuscript. And then the second volume is a study by one of the preeminent Guillaume de Michaud scholars, Professor Larry Earp, and art historian Professor Dominic Leo, who provided art historical commentary on the stunning 118 miniatures by a workshop of court illuminators led by the artist known as the master of the Bible, Jean de C. And uh, here's just one example uh, of the just stunning artwork in this uh, in this manuscript. It is believed that the artists who worked on this manuscript and others in this group are almost exclusively associated with the crown. And then on the music, um, a show included 125 works in this manuscript. And these consisted of 23 motets, 16 lay, 38 ballades, 15 rondeaux, 31 virelay, a textless hocket, and the four-part polyphonic uh, mass of Notre Dame. There's two pages missing. Maybe someday these will surface. Folios 321 and 383 have been lost. Uh, but not bad for almost 700 years to have as much as we have today. Uh, music appears on 235 pages of this manuscript. Uh, it appears that only one, unlike the artist, it appears that only one music scribe copied all of the music in this manuscript. Um, a craftsman with an excellent hand as you can see, and a true musician who well understood the Ars Nova notational system. So I want to switch very quickly to a link to show you what's actually happened since this uh, manuscript has been posted online. Um, a Belgian ensemble named Salentes, uh, and the translation to that is, <laughs> I think it's the singing, uh, anyway, okay. Um, who has used the digi uh, digitized online manuscript to perform directly from Machaut's work. So this is a brief, very brief excerpt from the Machaut's four-part mass, folio 238. So let me just do this very quickly because I think it's worth... Uh, 238 or 283? Two, 283. 283, thank you. <laughs> you need all the help I can get here, so let's see here. Let me do this. So this is the Belgian group. Oh. Okay. So it's really interesting because, so they've simply made a copy and uh, let's see if we can get this actually to work.
music, so... Good. Um, so regarding the manuscript um, and um, a little bit of its provenance, it was believed to have been completed in the late 1360s and the early 1370s, and documents may show complete oeuvre of literary and musical works at that time. The original owner is believed to have been uh, Jean the Duke of Berry, who lived from 1340 to 1416, among other things a noteworthy patron of the arts. A newly discovered letter dated November 18, 1388, from Violante de Bar, Queen of Aragon, to Gaston Phoebus, Count of Foix, expresses her wish to borrow the manuscript that her uncle, the Duke of Berry, had just given to the Count. Apparently, Jean de Berry loaned the manuscript to Gaston Phoebus in an effort to obtain the hand in marriage of Jean de Boulogne, the Count's young ward, who Jean de Berry would marry in 1389. So the book was so important that it gave him the entree. Count Phoebus did lend the manuscript, manuscript to Violante de Bar, and it appeared to have stayed in Aragon after his death in 1391, as it shows up in the inventory of Alfonso the Mag Magnanimous, King of Aragon, in 1417. Mm -hmm. The manuscript stayed in Catalonia through the reign of Alfonso, uh, and it, but then it eludes study in 1458 with the death of Maria of Castile, Queen of Aragon. Uh, the Pharaoh Vogue does not reemerge until the 18th century in the possession of Jean Baptiste de Machaut, so it's made it back to France. Uh, Machaut de Arnville, who lived from 1701 to 94, he was a minister in the government of Louis XV. So then the manuscript passed uh, to Lyon's Marquis de Vogue uh, through his wife. Um, this um, then went to their eldest son, Mel Melchoir Marquis de Vogue for whom part of the name uh, comes, um, who lived from 1829 to 1916. And um, his daughter, the Viscountess, uh, forgive the mispronunciations, Benoit Dazi, sold this manuscript to the main character of our World War II story, the Parisian art collector and dealer, Georges Wildenstein. Mm -hmm. The sale took place on December 11th, 1924. Uh, and with minor exception, there was almost no access, so there was no access to this manuscript while in Wilderstein's ownership. And then, as, as mentioned, this all changed in the 21st century. In 2004, James and Elizabeth Farrell, the current owners, um, purchased the manuscript in 1999, and in 2004 they put it on loan uh, at Parker Library at the University of Cambridge and consented to these copies. So a little bit about uh, about uh, the Wildenstein, George Wildenstein, who lived from 1892 to 1963, was a prominent Parisian art dealer. He was a collector, he was a connoisseur, and he was an art historian and author. Um, he assumed the direction of the gallery Wildenstein and C in 1934, after the death of his father, Nathan Wildenstein, who had opened this Paris gallery in 1875. Now moving to World War II, during World War II, the German occupation of Paris of June 14th caused George Wildenstein, who was Jewish, to flee the city with his family. And by October of 1940, uh, the Wildensteins had taken refuge at Aix-en-Provence while awaiting a passage to the U.S. Uh, before he fled, he deposited the Machot manuscript in safe number six at, a bank in, at the Bank of France in Paris. It was one of 342 objects that he put there for safety before he fled. Mm -hmm. While still in the south of France in 1940, he also shipped 302 of his most important artworks to the United States. But the boat carrying these objects was intercepted by a German submarine oh. and forced back to the Bordeaux Harbor, where its cargo was seized by the German authorities and transferred to the possession of the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, who I'll refer to as the ERR. Um, the ERR was the special task force that carried out the systematic plunder of material culture in regions of occupied Europe. It was led by uh, Alfred Rosenberg, Reichsleiter Alfred Rosenberg, and the ERR quickly became operational in France, in part under a July 5, 1940 order issued by the Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht, Wilhelm Keitel, authorizing the Gestapo and the ERR to search state archives and libraries, chancelleries of high church authorities and lodges 
in France, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg for materials valuable to Germany and provided for their seizure. Vichy legislation was introduced uh, July 22, 1940, which revoked French citizenship of Jews living abroad, and property that they left behind, the deportees and immigrants left behind, was subject to confiscation under this order. Then in September, September 17, 1940, Kiedel issued an order formally authorizing the seizure of ownerless uh, Jewish possessions. These were things left behind in the occupied territories for materials considered valuable to Germany. This order swept in Jewish-owned artworks under the protection of the French Museum administration. And this included some of George Wildenstein's paintings, um, which were some of the more at Chateau Sorge. So, Chief of the Reich's Chancellery, Dr. Hans Lammers, and forgive me, but to me the law, the evolution of the law is very, you know, important and interesting to see the various steps that took place. Um, so on November 18, 1940, uh, Hans Lammers uh, issued an order that reserved Hitler's right to decide the disposition of confiscated art objects in occupied territories so he could select from those objects uh, for various purposes, and he did do that. Uh, cultural, confiscated cultural objects were initially held in Paris at the German Embassy under the direction of German Ambassador Otto Abetz. Uh, some of Wildenstein's property was reported to have been at this location. And then in, in October of 1940, the Louvre became one of the ERR's depots for confiscated cultural objects. But by the end of October, they'd run out of room at the Louvre and they then started to use the Jeux de Pomme in the Tuileries Garden. Uh, for a storage depot for an ERR confiscated property. So we know from historical records that George Wildenstein's confiscated art ended up at both the Louvre and the Jeux de Pomme. And Reich Marshal Hermann Goering selected at least 14 of George Wildenstein's uh, artworks from the confiscated stocks of the ERR in Paris, including four pieces uh, taken November 5th from the Jeux de Pomme. We know some of this detail from an ERR register of letters and messages recovered um, uh, after the war uh, in some of the captured German records, um, which were very important to try to reconstruct this history. So um, a little bit on the ERR. So the ERR, this is kind of an organizational chart, a little hard to see probably, but they had various subdivisions based on topical categories. and. Um, um, music was among these. And so the Sonderstab Musik was a task, special task force charged with the confiscation of all things musical. Um, it was led by musicologist Dr. Herbert Gehrig, who established the Sonderstab Musik in Paris on uh, August 17, 1940, so very early uh, after the occupation. Confiscations of musical materials started uh, right away in September of 1940. There was a, another very important seizure in Paris uh, of the large uh, and significant music library and musical instrument collection owned by harpsichordist Wanda Landowska, and that was just right outside of Paris. The Sonderstab Musique staff prepared inventories for the seized property of various musical luminaries and others, including Wanda Landowska, composer Darius Mio, who uh, was a local immigrant, um, Arthur Rubinstein, Charles Panagorski, and many others but um, many others that the Nuremberg laws and other discriminatory legislation, you know, put in the, uh, in the sights of um, the German authorities at this time. The whereabouts of these inventories, we have some of them, but we don't have all of them. A lot of the captured records are very helpful, but much is still missing, and records are kind of splintered in many countries, very difficult to do the research. Um, so once the musical, and music is my focus, so that's where I'm going with a lot of this discussion, um, these objects, once collected, were scattered in various depots in Paris um, and separated by different categories. Um, separate from that, um, going back to this manuscript, on October 30th, 1940, the German Dievenschutz Commando, which is the foreign currency control in Germany, which I'll call the DSK, confiscated the contents of George Wildenstein's safe, oh. number six at the Bank of France. The DSK uh, left a receipt, which we have thanks to the Wilderness Science, which kindly provided this for this study. Uh, with an, um, um, it has an, there's an inventory, which I'll show you an excerpt from that, of items seized from George Wilson Science Bank vault. 
Um, the receipt was delivered to Monsieur Mollard, the Wilden Science family representative who had the power of attorney in Paris. And uh, you see the translation there, but basically under the law um, for the occupied French territories, all of your paintings and other art objects on the attached list located in your safe number six of the Bank of France Paris are hereby secured. For any dispositions concerning these objects, you will need my express and written consent. This also applies to any change in property status, i.e. sale, pawning, gift, and violations against these arrangements are punishable in accordance with Section 9 of the Second Provision Foreign Currency Regulations, August 14, 1940. We think uh, Inspector Hartman of the DSK signed this. The signature is not that easy to read. And then, uh, whoop, let's see here. Um, so then we have the inventory. There were 160 items, so I've included just an excerpt here to show you um, and made a little red arrow so you can see there's an entry that simply lists item number 152, nine manuscripts, which is believed to have included the Michaud manuscript, but it's too generic to be absolutely sure, but it seems like that, that would have been the entry. Um, the DSK in France was under the direction of Herbert Staffeld, who reported directly to Hermann Goering and the DSK opened safety, safety deposit boxes in banks throughout um, Paris and confiscated securities and other valuables. So um, they separated foreign exchange assets uh, which were, were transferred to the Reichsbank, uh, which is important when you think about uh, the tra trail of money in researching this topic. But the um, confiscated art and objects were transferred to the ERR. And so because this was uh, an object, it did go into the stocks of the ERR, the manuscript. Meanwhile, on January 17, 1914, Wildenstein, his wife and four children, the youngest listed as an infant on the ship Manifest, managed to sail for Lisbon to New York on the SS Siboney. A few months later, in April 41, his art business was Aryanized. He left behind a large collection of art and cultural objects in his gallery and in several other locations. His former employer, Roger DeCoy, took over control of the gallery through the organization process, and he renamed it Gallery DeCoy. After the war, questions were raised, and they still resonate uh, with no clear answers, I don't believe at this time, regarding whether or not Wildenstein may have benefited from wartime transactions in Europe. Whether or not this was the case, the documentary record that I've seen confirms uh, that he was clearly a victim of the Nazi era and confiscations, including the Michaud manuscript. So um, what's interesting in trying to understand how this manuscript traveled in tracing its history, um, because of its musical significance, it became separated. Somebody pulled it out from all the other things, and it's interesting because it's a literary work, it's an artistic work, and it's a musical work, and yet uh, clearly the musical Sonnerstadt Musique did pull it out from all the other uh, Wildenstein materials. And it was then incorporated into a large group of looted French materials from Paris, including musical manuscripts, printed music, books, musical instruments, phonograph records, historical co correspondence, and other music-related objects. Um, <coughs> so we know that um, his objects were at the German embassy, the Louvre, and the Pomme, but I don't know, we don't, there's no record that I have found, and I've looked fairly hard, of this manuscript being mentioned in any depot in Paris, but it was clearly somewhere there. Um, the first shipments the ERR made from France to Germany took place in April 1941. And I've just posted an example just so you can see um, of a transport list leaving from Paris. And this is kind of what some of them looked like. This is a keyboard instrument listed by Maker. And interestingly, keyboards often have serial numbers. So if someone were to, you could probably find these instruments today. So um, and, Thousands of pianos were confiscated in Paris. Really, it's a remarkable story. Um, anyway, so these had the French storage depot number and unique signatures. Um, so many of Wildenstein's objects, along with other valuable uh, collections, were sent by train uh, via special escort um, of the Luftwaffe personnel on a three-day ride from Paris to Neuschwanstein, just a few miles from Fusen. So Neuschwanstein, which is what Disneyland was modeled after, 
um, held a lot of important artwork and a lot of important records when the Allies came after the war. Um, the next clue to the whereabouts of the Michaud manuscript, uh, possible whereabouts, shows up in a May 6, 1943 German shipment inventory uh, that I found in the Bundes archive of musical objects uh, bound from an unknown location in Germany to a depot in the Bavarian countryside where these objects were evacuated to avoid damage from Allied bombing in city centers in Germany. So the Michaud manuscript isn't on this list, but it's with items on this list that were in the same place when the U.S. Army found these objects. So clearly it seems highly likely it was with them, and it was an abbreviated list. Um, so um, U.S. Uh, during the war, um, many in the art world became alarmed at the potential for destruction of fine arts, monuments, and other cultural valuables in Europe as a result of the war, just as we are today for the loss of culture uh, in parts of the world. Um, the British and the U.S. formed special units to address these concerns, and in the U.S., these issues were brought to President Roosevelt's attention, and he established the American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of artistic and historic monuments in war areas on August 20, 1943. Also established uh, by the U.S. War Department's Civil Affairs Division was the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Division, which I will refer to as the MFA and A. So this is the group that you've probably heard about, the Monuments Men. There were women in that group, so maybe MFA and A is more accurate. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they really were amazing, and uh, they involved, were involved in wartime efforts to protect monuments and cultural property, but after the war, the MFANA uh, was instrumental in recovering, protecting, returning, uh, looted, and otherwise displaced cultural objects in war-torn Europe. A lot of these objects were actually German property, Austrian property. It was, uh, it was just kind of a scrambled egg that they tried to unscramble. Um, this is just an example of a U.S. Third Army soldier, the third um, Army Division was very active in looking for cultural objects. So this is at Ellingen. So this is photos from the U.S. National Archive. Um, and this is an example also from the U.S. National Archive of looted books in Amsterdam. So by September 1948, the U.S. military government for Germany estimated that U.S. forces had found 1,500 repositories of art and cultural objects in Germany. There were others in Austria. So uh, I think that's limited to Germany. And according to a 2000 Presidential Advisory Commission report, these property depots contained 10.7 million objects worth an estimated $5 billion. Jeez. So it was in one of these depots that the U.S. Army found the Michelle Manuscript. On May 30th, and here's, here's the memo uh, that I found in the U.S. National Archive, um, U.S. Private First Classman Stilson, I've not been able to figure out his first name, reported to the MFANA detachment, quote, a castle full of pianos, accordions, violins, etc., believed to have come from French museums. The castle is located at Berghausen on der Salzach, on the border of uh, the Tyrol, about 130 kilometers from Munich. So he'd heard this secondhand from someone in Munich. He hadn't actually seen it himself. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, pretty much today. A beautiful... Uh, building, and um, it turned out um, that, the, that the site wasn't Berghausen, but about four miles away, it was actually Rentenhaslag, is where all of this stuff was, also at a bend in the Salzach River. The objects were not from French museums, but were instead taken in large part, but not entirely, by the ERR and the Sonderstab Musique from French owners, and they were housed in multiple buildings that were described in contemporary records as a monastery, a castle, and a brewery. So, the U.S. Army also encountered another surprise at Rayton Hoslock. The ERR custodian, who was actually put there to guard this property, was still there when they arrived. His name was Herman Kern, and uh, he was left to guard the property. He provided the U.S. Army with two declarations, which are kind of helpful. They mostly reflect the incredible chaos of the time and the lack of security of the objects. Um, so, um, so that was uh, in June, and despite these efforts, by July 21st of 45, there was still confusion about where these objects were, because there's a U.S. memo 
Um, oh, here's another image. Uh, it's interesting. Today, Ritten Hasluck has been restored and is used as an educational facility. Hmm. I don't know if there's any trace of, <laughs> uh, you know, mention of its use during the time, but, you know, I would expect there might be. Um, Germany has been worked very hard to deal with restitution issues. Um, so there, but there was still confusion in July of 20, July 21st about uh, where the objects were. And uh, at this time, uh, Berghausen under Salsak was still identified in documents as the place where these materials were. Uh, and in the same memo, it was stressed by a member of the MFANA the importance of the responsibilities regarding the care and preservation of cultural objects, which you know was a major task of the U.S. Army and other Allied forces. But it would not be until the end of August that Raiden Hoslock would finally be inspected and documented. Um, one of the challenges met by the AM MFANA in the field was distinguishing between plundered and displaced German property, as these items were in many instances stored in the same repositories. And this was true at Raiden Hoslock. Mm -hmm. um, in addition uh, to property confiscated from France, they found five large bookcases and 250 crates. Um, from the Munich University Library. They found uh, materials uh, from the state art collection, uh, musical instruments from the Munich Philharmonic mm -hmm. uh, Orchestra, uh, personal property belonging to German private parties. Um, of the French material, this was listed in an August 27th memo by Officer Moray to include about 65 pianos, spinets, harmoniums, modern and antiquated French markings, about 80 crates of music also, and books, and a number of portable instruments, violins, guitars, wind instruments, photograph records, etc. How am I doing that? Good. Oh, okay. Um, Officer Moray described the condition of the property as chaotic. Material is described through the house, some in locked rooms, some not. Many crates have been opened, supposedly by inspe inspecting officers. Some damage has been done. A Herr Kern, a custodian of the ERR, was in residence till two weeks ago when he went to Munich. Uh, the next day, the same officer wrote another memo, alarmed that the Rosenberg looted material at Red and Hoslock was not securely stored, considering its fragile nature. It should be given high priority for removal. And he repeated concerns about a pursuit of Herman Kern, the ER custodian, and he said, quote, he has in his possession the key to a locked strong room said to contain records of the collection. Um, although I found, I think, every shred of paper on Retton Hall's lock in the Bundes Archive. I don't know that I, what was behind that locked door uh, and whether anybody knows and, or what happened to it because I've never found another reference to it. Um, Moray, the U.S. Army uh, officer, estimated it would take 25 truckloads from Renton Hoslock to Munich for the looted Rosenberg material from this location. So, um, so archival records show that some musical objects discovered at Renton Hoslock, they do match Sonderstab music inventories, confiscations in Paris, so I do have matches. Um, so then what happened is that the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Division of the U.S. Army set up several central collecting depots in Germany and some in Austria to protect, to process, and to return this property. Um, um, this is just an example of the Offenbach Archival Depot. So this is where Jewish religious items, books, archives, and some music ended up here. Some that is still the fate, uh, you know, its origin is still unknown. There's a lot of unclear uh, case studies among these materials. This is the building, the Munich CCP, which was actually set up in a former National Socialist Party building in Munich. If you've been to Munich, you will recognize the, the building, probably. It was used primarily for plundered materials, subject to restitution, but it also housed uh, Bavarian State Museum artif artifacts and you know, materials that were to be restituted. And uh, so the, the Michaud manuscript was taken by truck here. It was not photographed. It's one of the issues I have a hard time with because they took photographs of everything, down to spoons. I mean, it's very detailed. There's so little. The expertise on music was very thin among the MFANA. They had hired a lot of art uh, experts, architecture, sculpture, but there was very few, very few uh, members of that team that were experts in music. And, um, and you see it in the records. It's reflected, and it makes this job more difficult today. So the MFANA shipped the materials from Renton Hoslock to Munich in three shipments in September, the 7th, 10th, and 12th. 
and field notes a report this collection appears to have come from France, but nothing specific is known about its origin. Oh, here's another image of the inside with books. So this is, con you can't probably, oh, oh yes. yeah, maybe you can. Oh. Yeah. This is what it looked like at one point on the inside. So this is again from the U.S. National Archive. Um, but in these uh, truckloads were man musical manuscripts, printed music, literature books, records, ins a lot of instruments, and many other musical things, keyboard instruments. So um, here's just one of the shipping records. So it's very difficult. The records were pretty poorly kept. The ERR used alphanumeric codes, but unfortunately these codes were not recorded in a systematic manner by the U.S. Army. And um, Officer Moray stated, quote, um, all these numbers have a letter prefix, but it was not taken down for the first 14 cases. Oh, so we see in this example music by Bach, Mozart, Gluck. We actually have, you know, 16 violins, 12 violins. We have a Warsaw manuscript. This would arguably be from Wanda Landowska's uh, music library uh, mm -hmm. outside of Paris because she was of Polish origin and did a lot of... Uh, uh, she has a similar entry in her own inventory. Um, so um, there's also a note in this memo saying from Officer Moray, many of these cases have been repacked and the contents are not those listed on labels. Oh, oh God. God. So confirming the disarray and the chaos and maybe t tampering and loss of uh, objects uh, from this period of time. So in the end, the U.S. removed 1,659 pieces of property from right in the Hoslock. Um, and this included both looted and German property. So on arrival at Munich, um, and let me show you, let's see here. Uh, so this is the Michelle property card. This is what the US Army generated. Um, they, they had these cards with all these data fields. They had a, a, a number, a rival number, um, the object's classification. I mean, this is really what it gets down to for all of these objects, this level of uh, research to try and trace something. Um, the author, the subject, presumed owner, material, measurements, uh, arrival condition, identifying marks, description, etc. It goes on and on and on. Um, often these cards are difficult because they can sometimes have many objects as associated with them as just kind of a generic title. Um, and there were 50,000 of these cards from Munich alone in our U.S. National Archive. And many of these cards have multiple items, so the exact number of items, it's, it's hard to determine. Um, there's also a set of these cards in the Bundes Archive, but um, they're, in, they're, they're not a match. There's differences, and even in the U.S. National Archive, there are four sets uh, from different stages, and some of those sets have more updated information. So it's, it's very, very difficult uh, tracing the facts. Um, anyway, so what's interesting about this card Many things are interesting, but they misspell Machau, Kiyam de Machau. It's spelled Machan. And um, if you look at this manuscript, he actually hides his name in various. There, it's, there's a few instances where Machau is actually in there, but unless it was marked by ERR documentation, it might have been. Um, I don't know how they got the name. Nobody knows, but it was misspelled, and I don't know whether. There was a musicologist or anybody that was interested that would have known who Guillaume de Michaud was, but in any case, there was a misspelling, and it, it shows up more than once in different records, so it was not corrected. Um, the numbers on this card, just to give you an idea, 8,181 means it's that number of items that made it to Munich. So it was, it, it was the 8,181st item that made it to the Munich Central Collecting Depot. It was the 86th item from right in the Hoslock. And then the subgroup, it was the third in the subgroup of 86. Um, presumed owner, unknown, identified according to label. Most of these cards say that, so I don't know if they have labels or not, uh, but they don't come down to us today. Um, Confiscated, here's the back of the card, confiscated by the ERR. It has an entry date and an exit date from the depot. So how, they, how the U.S. dealt with these objects, they permitted foreign missions to come into these depots to try and identify their nation's property. And captured German records played an important role in this because they kept, there were good records if they could be found. And so those the ERR records found at New Schwanstein and other areas were used to try and um, figure out <coughs> Um, what was what, there were 20,000 catalog cards found at New Schwanstein, uh, representing 
each representing a confiscated work or group of works, 8,000 negatives, and a file drawer full of records. Um, and there were um, 302 items in those records involving Georges Rubenstein, but not the Machado manuscript. It was his artwork. So in France, France was really unique in this uh, effort. They published a multi-volume um, um, book set there was an inventory of French claims, and they called upon the public to make claims. So it's the Repertoire de Bien Spolet en France durant la guerre, 1939 to 45. This was published in 1947 to 49. So it's a kind of an amazing effort because it's uh, seven, let's see how many volumes it is. I think it's seven volumes with many supplements. It's eight volumes with several supplements. And it was prepared by the Bureau Central of Restitutions. I think I need to speed along here. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, George Wildenstein had filed some claims. And I found these, thanks to the France Berkeley Fund, uh, work in France on, uh, in his claim file in the archive of the Foreign Ministry, uh, uh, European and Foreign Ministry Affairs. Um, and so um, this is how it was published in very summary format. Um, it was in volume seven, manuscripts previous to 1800. It was listed item 358, poetry, 15th century manuscript on vellum, enhanced with numerous small miniatures and ornamented initial letters. These are massive uh, uh, publications. Maison Georges Wildenstein. Um, he was assigned a number, so all of his losses had this one number. Um, and then, uh, importantly, um, his claim file, which is really, if you go to the, these are very summary, you have to go to the underlying claim file to actually see what was in there. And so he had inventories, and he listed uh, this specific uh, uh, item as a loss, which you can see here. Um, and he listed it as something taken from the Bank of France. And then this is the clincher, because I almost never see this. He had photographed. Oh. And so these were in his claim file. Without Perfect. this, I mean, so many things were returned. There were either no claimants, they were considered airless, mm -hmm. or they were returned and the owners could not be connected with them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things, if they were really valuable, they would be held in trust even today in uh, public institutions. But many things were auctioned off that could, for owners that couldn't be found, that were considered airless. Mm -hmm. So these photographs were quite unique, really made the connection. Um, wow. So. The way the U.S. dealt with restitution after the war, they couldn't really return everything to individuals. They decided to, as a restitution policy, something called external restitution. They restituted to the presumed country of origin. And it was up to that nation then to find the owners, which is one of the reasons this is still a topic today. It's been a very difficult uh, process. Um, so uh, most of the things from Reitin Hoslock were returned in 1946. It would take until July 1st, 1949, for this manuscript to be sent back to Paris. Um, here's the shipment record. It was the 37th post-war shipment of plundered property from Munich to Paris. It had 266 items. And again, Guillaume de Machan is the spelling. Owner unknown. and. Um, we, have, we know who the captain, the French captain was, and the U.S. captain that signed off on the receipt, um, releasing that uh, ownership. Um, and then in, back into the claim file, we have confirmation um, that, the, that on November 24, 1949, George Wildenstein actually got this back from the French government. Uh, interesting to me is it states that it's, it was in Austria. That's what's on the receipt oh, oh, oh. in the salt mine of Alt Ossi, which was one of the most amazing repositories, enormous, had great wealth in it and records. Um, but the other manuscript on that list was actually found in Alt Ossi. Several things of Wilden Science were found in Alt Ossi. So that, that's a mistake. Um, and then we have an undated, uh, uh, an undated inventory indicating there's a little R. It's handwritten with a little R indicating restitution. So, in conclusion, with the return of the Macho manuscript in the autumn of 49, the tumultuous Nazi era history of this 14th century work, a rare amalgam of literary, artistic, and musical importance, came to a just end. Um, th throw this on here. The judgment in Nuremberg found Rosenberg guilty of, among many things, war crimes associated with the systematic plunder 
public and private cultural property throughout occupied Europe. In France alone, 38,000 Jewish homes were plundered. More than 21,903 uh, objects were seized by the ERR in the West by July of 44. And what's interesting about this judgment, it really is the first time that we have um, the first international enforcement of cultural property law and an accounting for cultural property losses. So that's an important, from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. uh, an important first. Um, for the decades after the end of World, I'm on the last page, mm -hmm. decades after World War II, until the reunification of Germany and the end of Cold War, it was very, very little was done. There were some returns, but things really stalled. People were trying to get their lives back together. Uh, archives, a lot of archives were not accessible. Uh, documents were classified, many issues. So it wasn't until the end of the Cold War, uh, really, and the reunification of Germany that things started to make progress. And a heightened focus, which still exists today, at a pretty fierce pace, of doing provenance research, analysis, and disclosure in connection to efforts to reconstruct this history. It's so difficult uh, to do. Now, the digitization of records has really helped a lot. Many nations have digitized their records and posted them online, but having been on some of these trips, many of these uh, archives, you have to go there. Um, they're in many languages, in many places. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so this is an issue, but there's been a lot of progress. So I want to close with a few thoughts, not on the still missing cultural objects lost or dis uh, displaced during the Nazi era, but on cultural objects like the Michelle manuscript um, that have been found. I want to pose a question to you, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, because there's some debate on the topic and there hasn't been much progress on the topic for music. For a literary, musical, or artistic work, would you rather come to the written word, the concert, the manuscript, the exhibition, in order to experience what the artist has created in its intrinsic state, or reading the words, listening to the music, beholding the art, for whatever it, it might evoke, without external information? Or would it be preferable to come to the cultural object with all its intrinsic value and contextualize within its past the object biography as a portal to the lives tethered to it and to its political, cultural, and social history. It's actually a live issue. Does this information distract from the art object, uh, or does it enhance the meaning, knowledge, and experience? Um, in a sense, it's a curatorial question. And I've seen so many things where this is a silent history of things that are in public institutions. Uh, but it's one that warrants attention, I think. Walter Benjamin, uh, a German-Jewish philosopher and cultural critic, said in 1936, Considering the importance of the original object in another context, but I think it fits, the authenticity of a thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration mm -hmm. to its testimony to the history which it has experienced. We know the thing can experience, but... Um, and what is really jeopardized when the historical testimony is affected is the authority of the object. So with the nearly 700-year history, of our Michaud manuscript here. Uh, it provides new insights, the information we have into its meaning, its place in history, reconstructing the manuscripts, Nazi era past, and the associated profound dislocation of culture to which it fell victim for a time. It's just one chapter in this ongoing history and provides a new context for reconsidering the manuscripts, continuing importance to our collective cultural heritage. Thank you.